gotta open up the Blu-ray of Jaws because I ain't opened it up yet. I watched it on Netflix, but I had to own it because it's good. Yeah. Hello everybody, E here. Welcome back to Book vs. Movie. Finally, with episode two, we're finally talking about Jaws. Word of warning before you continue on with this video. If you have not seen the movie and you have not read the book, there's going to be spoilers for both. So if you care about spoilers and haven't read the book, haven't seen the movie, I suggest UGTFO. What I hope to accomplish with this series is the age-old question, is the book always better than the movie? Before we jump into which is better, I want to tell you a short story um, about me and my grandmother. My grandmother used to take all of us grandkids, she had something like 20, 25 grandkids, um, but she would always make time for each and every one of us, um, and one of my most prized memories from when I was a child is us going to Universal Studios every, every now and again. It was once a year we would go to a theme park, sometimes it was Knott's Berry Farm. If you don't know, I grew up in Southern California. Um, either it was Knott's Berry Farm, Magic Mountain, Disneyland, or Universal Studios. And one of the things that I remember the most about the Universal Studios trips is, of course, the section where you go over the rickety dock and Jaws comes out of the water. Um, I loved that section of it. I loved everything about it. And it just watching this movie, reading this book, brought back so many pleasant memories of my grandmother. And I couldn't have asked for a better experience. Right off the bat, if we are going along the timeline of the movie, right off the bat, you hear more from the kids than you in the movie version than you ever do in the book. Uh, the, one of the things, one of the problems that I had with the book was there wasn't enough of the family, and I didn't really see the purpose of the kids. Now I'm an author myself, and one of the big pet peeves I have is repetition and fluff. Um, I, in fact, I can't even call this fluff or superfluous information because. I mean, the kids are used throughout, but it is very, very small roles that they are mentioned. In fact, I don't think you ever hear one of the kids talk in the book whatsoever. I could be wrong, but if they do talk in the book, it wasn't memorable. In the movie, the town looks about how I imagined it in the book. It's a very quaint little uh, New England town. Uh, I think it's in, what, New York? Uh, is it Amity, New York? I think that's it. Uh, it looked about how I suspected, but one thing I did notice right off the bat is there were far more people when the visitors came in. There were far more people in this town than there ever was in the book. Boy Scouts are new. That's some bad hat, Harry. A huge difference between the book and the movie is Quint comes in super early into the story in the movie. In the book, he doesn't come in, I think, until about halfway through, and he gets a real quick chapter. You hear from him something about, you know, there's the big shark out there, or I can't remember exactly what he's thinking. I know that he's introduced with his own chapter, and then it goes directly back to Brody, or it might even go back to Ellen, who we're going to talk about a lot in this video. Brody's wife, Ellen, is in the is, has a major role in the book, whereas she doesn't in the movie. Now, as far as Quint is concerned, I was actually really shocked that he came in so early at first. And then I realized, hey, no wonder this guy's there more, because I like this version of the character. I love the actor that played the guy. Um, so that's big point for the movie. Another person who has a bigger role in the movie that has a ra relatively smaller role in the book is Mrs. Kintner, the mother of the boy who's eaten by the shark after Brody wanted to shut down the beach. Public in the movie, and it wasn't public right off the bat in the book, which is another thing that I, I actually liked more right up front. We get that out of the way that Brody wanted to close the beach, but nobody would let him. As I'm watching the movie, it is very obvious to me that the movie has a much lighter tone than the book. This is almost, almost a family movie. Now, it was rated PG-13, but back then it took a lot to get an R rating for whatever reason. I think you had to have, like, gratuitous sex and, you know, 100 F-words if, if you got an R rating back then. But a lot of movies were PG-13. Um, in today's market, with as much blood as in this movie, I'm sure that if Jaws came out today, it would be a, a, a rated R movie. And they probably would have cut back a lot, especially with the murder of the kit, no, the, the killing, I wouldn't say the murder, um, the killing of the Kittner boy. That was bloody as hell. I was shocked that they went that far. People were shocked in, uh, at the beginning of It, 
that they actually went for the full-on Georgie scene. Exactly what happens to him in the book. I'm not going to spoil anything for that movie, but or the book. But a lot of people were shocked that that happened. That they showed as much as they did. Whereas in the old 19, was it 95? I can't remember exactly. The old Tim Curry version, they just cut away with the kids screaming. Now we get into one of the biggest differences in the book. And I'm going to be here for a while. The movie version of Hooper doesn't know Ellen Brody. Um, there is no awkward, very awkward, you know, uh, restaurant scene where they're t where she's talking about, just tells the dude right off the bat that she has a rape fantasy, um, and they end up sleeping together you know, very, very, very quickly. Um, it, she knows that she wants the dude, she's going to go after the dude. Um, but what, what struck me very odd is when I watched the movie, and there was no, there was no mention that they didn't even know each other. There was no infidelity subplot, and that's what made the movie, I think, that much better. There's one other point that I, I'm going to get to that I think makes the movie win this, but it seemed watching the movie version, it seemed like that 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 whole infidelity subplot just it, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. It seemed tacked on to make the book longer than it was. See, with the movie version, you didn't have to, they didn't have to go into that. You still have a, a, a big runtime for the movie. It's two hours long. You, you don't fi you don't miss it. I, the, and when when I watch movie adaptations, I always say, okay, well, I missed that part of the of the book. I missed this. I missed that. And that's one of the main reasons people say they like the books better. But here. I actually enjoyed the fact that they cut that. I had no problem with them cutting it. Leaving it in might have made it a, a darker film, a darker experience, but there was no purpose for it. No purpose whatsoever. But that does completely nerf the Ellen character. The Ellen character in the movie is just a, a support character, just someone off on the side, whereas in the book she's more of a main character because all that content there in the middle is her, you know, hooking up with Hooper and causing the backstory with the drama between Brody and Hooper. But in the movie, they don't mind each other. In fact, they're pretty buddy with each other. They have wine together. They Well, I guess Brody does know Ellen because they had dinner together, but they don't hook up. And I liked the back and forth between Richard Dreyfus and, oh, uh, what's his name, Roy Schneider. I liked the back and forth between those guys, their versions of Brody and Hooper. I liked that much more than any of the interactions in the book where they were arguing. Uh, this is one of the only times where I, I was happy with the fact that they got rid of drama. Um, it made the movie more fun, it made the movie more entertaining to watch these, especially on the boat when they were there with Quint. It gave you a bit of comfort before the final fight at the end, and I thought that was really, really cool. Once again, I'm going to be talking about something that won the movie version over for me, probably my favorite part of the movie, period. Quint's World War II story. The, the story that he, ta that he tells uh, Brody and Hooper about the sinking of his ship and the survival and the sharks and all that, that section is amazing. It is probably in my top ten of all time of cinematic like monologues. I, re I was sitting there listening to this guy and the movie kind of went away. I don't know if that's a positive or negative for some people, but for me it was really cool because it was like I was in an audio book. I was just listening to this guy and I was picturing in my mind what he must have gone through. Whoever wrote that scene, brilliant. Um, I don't know if there was ad-lib going on, I don't know if he stuck directly to the script, but the actor did a terrific job bringing that history and bringing that character development without a load of exposition. I, there is a little bit of exposition with the telling instead of showing, but here it works. It feels like an old boat captain telling a story, and that's exactly what it is. It's the most realistic section of the, the movie is him sitting down and talking about this terrible tragedy that happened while he was out at sea in World War II. One thing I will say about Quint, though, is him running his motor to the breaking point and it completely crapping out. It just seemed against character for that character. Um, Quint seemed like a rational individual, um, even though he, he's a little off his rocker as far as the whole fisherman thing is concerned. You know, being alone too much, whatever you want to say. But um, there was an aspect of that that didn't feel right about Quint's character, whether it be the book, especially the book version of Quint wouldn't have done that. And this version of Quint, I don't see him 
especially after what happened in the World War II, that story that he told, I don't believe that he would have ran his engine to the breaking point. Maybe he would have pushed it a little too hard and then backed off, but for the most part, I think that was really out of character, and I'm going to give the Quint version, uh, the, the book version of Quint, I'm going to give him the point here. And of course, we come to the point where I know everybody will probably talk about it, the only problem that people have with this movie is that the shark is dated. Um, the special effects are antiquated. Um, you have a mechanical shark. They didn't have to think, th actually think whoever that they didn't have CGI back then because of the <laughs> because I don't think it would have worked very well. Um, especially I'm I'm thinking of movies like Deep Blue Sea and whatnot, or maybe Ghost Shark. <laughs> Sorry, I just I mean, but if you've seen the movie, the ghost coming, the ghost shark coming out of the pool is amazing. Anywho, <laughs> back to the <laughs> back to the differences. So um, with the shark, I, I imagine the shark much bigger than it was. Of course, they had limitations with the animatronics and all that in the movie, but I imagined it much bigger. Not Megalodon bigger, but I imagined it much bigger than it was in the movie. Maybe that was just my own brain working, but I mean, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how big, I think it was what, a 25 footer, something like that in the book, I'm not exactly sure, but it didn't seem to be a 25 foot shark in the, maybe 10, 15 feet, maybe that. I could be wrong and my spatial awareness is completely off, but it seemed like a bigger shark in the book. Of course, that's explained away, like I said, with the limitations of the special effects. But I didn't have a problem with the limitation of the special effects. I watched the movie, I am super critical of books and movies and their, you know, the way things are tackled. I didn't have a problem with it. Um, now, did the shark look real? I don't know. I haven't seen too many sharks. But did the shark act realistic? I have no idea. I personally did not have a problem with the movie version of the shark. Now, you look at it here on the Blu-ray, which I haven't even held up. I went and bought the Blu-ray just so I could hold it up for you guys. What? Anyways, the, uh, the shark on here is far, looks far more menacing than the book in the, uh, in the movie, of course. But then I realized something when it came, it's just the, it's literally, it's, a, it's the poster, it's the one on here, is the one on here. So, anyways, this is the paperback I couldn't find. Remember when I did my Congo book versus movie? I couldn't find my paperback of Jaws. <laughs> well, I finally found it. It's in terrible condition, especially after me reading it, um, but I'm probably going to end up getting an updated version of it also. Um, but I got the Blu-ray of Jaws, even though I did watch it on, I think, Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's one or the other. Um, and I, I had to end up owning it. But the Blu-ray on Amazon was actually cheaper than the DVD version. Uh, and that was, but that was during Black Friday, so it's probably not the same anymore. Now, the Rob Schneider, we're gonna need a bigger boat line is iconic. If you don't know, um, I had never seen the movie up until the point when I read the book and I watched the movie, this is only like five months ago, y'all. Um, I know it's been a while. Um, I've been preparing for this for, for, for a minute. Um, but I'd never actually seen the scene. Um, I, I knew it was there, I, but I'd never saw <laughs> Roy Schneider. Um, I, I've seen clips of him doing the reaction, but I've never seen the reaction and the, <laughs> and the, uh, the actual line together in, in the movie. Uh, when I watched it, I think it's another one of the things that gives it to the movie version uh, is that it, that scene is it's iconic for a reason, but that scene actually made me laugh. I knew it was coming, I was looking for it, and it still made me laugh. Roy Schneider's reaction is perfect. And now we get to the point, the biggest, uh, well, uh, one of the, one another, another one of the big differences here is that Hooper survives. Um, I like that. Of course, I, I came to like the dude a lot more in the movie because he wasn't a douchebag, you know, having an affair with a married woman. This character, Richard Dreyfuss' Hooper, was probably my second, I would say it's my second, I loved Quint. Quint was way up here. Brody, I could, I mean, I know he's the main character, but I honestly could have done without, other than the, you're gonna need, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Um, scene, I probably could have done without Roy Schneider, he could have been anybody, but Richard Dreyfuss nailed that role and I will forever see him as Hooper. I actually preferred Quint's death in the book over the movie. Um, it was very, it, it was a great scene in the movie, but I think that the Ahab ending of the book 
was much better. I think that was a much better ending for that character because he had lived his life out in the sea. It brought things full circle for him. And the sea ended up killing him, not the shark. I mean, I guess it could be assumed that he dragged him down and then he ate him. But for me, I feel like he just dragged him down, drowned him, and just left him. The, <laughs> the action movie one-liner at the end of the movie... Man, as a <laughs> wrong genre, folks. So that's everything I found with the book and the movie. Did I miss some differences? Of course I did. I know there's a lot of really minor stuff, like there was two kids in the movie, three kids in the book, but I don't think that stuff's important or even interesting. Um, so what I talked about here was just the interesting stuff. If you have anything that you caught that isn't in one version or another, or improvements or reasons why you like the book, if it's not obvious, I like the movie more. So this is one of those times where the movie, I think, is better. Again, going back to Congo, I felt the same way. But if you have any reasons why you like the book more, maybe because it's a darker experience, maybe because you like the infidelity subplot, let me know down there in the comments below. But until next time, I have been E, you have been you, this has been Book vs. Movie, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye! Oh, for you guys who are still here, what do you want me to do next? I have a choice. Too, everybody clicked away already because I did my outro. But we have a choice between Choke by Chuck Palahniuk, which I would really love to reread. I've never seen the movie. And we have The Witches of Eastwick by John Updike. Which one of these you guys want to see next? Comment down below. Let me know. Bye-bye.